This algebraic geometry lecture will be mainly about Desargues theorem. In case anyone has using, is using subtitles, I'll just write out how you spell that. So he was a French mathematician and engineer who was one of the founders of projective geometry. Anyway, his theorem is like Pappus's theorem. It's kind of remarkable that it's only about points and lines. And it says the following. Suppose you take a point and you think of this point as being an observer. And the observer is kind of observing two triangles. So let me draw a couple of some lines for him to look at triangles on. So here we have an observer. You can think of his eye is here looking at things. <clears throat> And he's looking at a triangle here with three vertices A, B, and C. And he's also drawing on some easel. So um, um, on the easel, there's going to be three points A, B, and C that are the images of the triangle he sees. And what do you do? is you um, join up these three triangles like this. So um, here I'm going to take a blue triangle and a red triangle. I'm going to join up the lines BC of the red triangle, we're going to meet at a point here. And then I'm going to do the same thing for the AB side. So that side of the triangle meets this side of the capital ABC triangle. And finally, we do the same thing for the third sides joining A and C. So we've got an AC side going down here and an AC side going down here. So we've got three points here, and Pappus's theorem says that these three points lie in a straight line, which they don't quite in this case because I haven't drawn them very accurately. So th these points lie on a line. Um, so uh, this theorem, Pappus's theorem, has nine lines and nine points. Desargues' theorem has ten lines and 10 points. So this configuration of 10 lines and 10 points is sometimes called Desargues configuration. And um, so why is Desargues theorem true? Well, um, it's a theorem about points and lines in the plane, but in some sense, it's very difficult to prove if you stay inside the plane. So the key point of the proof is to imagine the triangles ABC and ABC in space. So we should think of this as being an tr triangles in a three-dimensional space. And in particular, the planes containing these two triangles should be different. We obviously can't do this in two dimensions because then the planes would have to be the same. And now we notice that we've got um, a line little a little b here and a line big a big b here and we notice these lines in space must actually meet because um, the lines through the two a's and the lines through the two b's meet which means that these two lines are actually in the same plane so these two lines must meet at a point in space so 
So we would say that, the, that then the lines AB and AB meet. And of course, the same thing is true for the lines AC and AC and the lines BC and BC by symmetry. So these points are actually well defined in space. And now you notice that each of these points, so the three points um, all lie on, they all lie in the plane containing the triangle ABC, and they also lie in the plane containing the triangle big ABC. So they lie on the intersection of these two planes, which is usually a line. It might not be a line because the two planes might be the same just by accident. Um, but if you choose these two planes in generic position, then their intersection will be a well-defined line. So all these three points lie on a line. Um, so if these triangles are not both contained in the same plane, then Desargues' theorem holds. And if they are contained in the same plane, then you can mumble something about taking limits and still deduce the theorem. Um, this theorem is particularly odd because it's a theorem entirely in two dimensions, and yet you can't really, in some sense, you can't really prove it except by moving up to three dimensions. Um, um, so um, if you've got a projective space of some dimension, if it has dimension at least three, it automatically satisfies Desargues' theorem for the two-dimensional planes in it because you can push everything up to three dimensions. If you've got a two-dimensional projective plane, it doesn't necessarily satisfy Desargues' theorem. So there are some examples called non-Desarguean planes which don't actually satisfy Desargues' theorem. Um, Desargues' theorem turns out to be in some sense equivalent to the um, associativity law for multiplication. So what you can do if you've got a projective space then, um, and you consult an old book on projective geometry, they will show how you can introduce coordinates over some sort of ring for the space. And Desargues' theorem Um, just says that this 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 ring is associative, and just as Pappus's theorem says that the ring is 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 commutative. The ring also tends to have inverses. Um, so the result of this is that if you take a projective space which satisfies Desargues' theorem, which is automatic in dimension at least three, and Pappus's theorem, then it comes from um, projective space over a field, at least if it's finite dimensional. So this shows that synthetic projective geometry, where you write down some axioms, is almost the same as um, analytic projective geometry, where you just write down a bunch of coordinates, um, except for the slight problem of non desarguean planes. So an example of a non-Desarguean plane might be a plane over some non-associative ring, such that the such as the the, the, the ring of octonians. Um, anyway, from now on, we'll be forgetting about um, synthetic differential geometry and just working with analytic geometry and coordinates. Um, this is a lot easier. For instance, if you're working in synthetic geometry and wanted to define a cubic curve, you could do it, but it'd be a real headache. Whereas in analytic geometry, it's just trivial. Um, there's another property of differential geom of projective geometry that was noticed fairly early on, which is duality for projective space. So let me give the simplest example of duality. Let's just look at a projective plane. And we have these axioms, any two distinct points meet in one 
one line. And similarly, any two distinct lines meet in a unique point. And you notice that these two axioms are dual if you swap the words point and line. And what this turns out to mean is that pretty much any theorem in uh, the projective plane that you say about lines and points is a dual theorem about points and lines. So we have a duality, points um, get switched with lines. Um, so a fairly typical example is Pascal's theorem. So you remember Pascal's theorem, you take a conic and take six points on it and fiddle around with them to do something or other. Um, the dual theorem, you take a conic, it turns out the dual of a conic is the same as a conic. And instead of taking six points um, on the conic, you take six lines tangent to the conic and then there's a sort of dual version of Pascal's theorem saying if you take the, 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 the three points given by intersecting these lines in pairs, they all meet. It. So if you take the um, um, I don't know if, which way around it goes. Um, so Pascal's theorem says that if you take um, three three points given by intersecting pairs of lines, they all lie on a straight line. This says if you take three lines given by um, joining up pairs of points in three different ways, then they all meet at a point. Um, so um, one way of thinking about duality is it's just duality of vector spaces. So projective space corresponds to that the points correspond to lines of um, affine space of dimension n plus one, which we think of being an n plus one dimensional vector space. Um, so points of p to the n correspond to lines of this. And similarly, lines in p to the n correspond to planes of a to the n plus one and so on. Um, planes would correspond to three dimensional subspaces and so on. Now for any vector space k to the n plus one, you can take a dual space of all linear transformations, which is also isomorphic to k to the n plus one, although not in a canonical way. And if you've got a line in a n plus one, you can take its dual, which would be a hyperplane, just consisting of all linear transformations vanishing on this. So lines correspond to hyperplanes. Planes correspond to things of co-dimension two, and so on, and you get all the way up to hyperplanes, um, which correspond to lines which are just points of projective space. So duality for projective space is very closely related just to taking the dual of a vector space.